All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're ready here. Oh, the mic's a little hot. I'm Lance Ward. Welcome to the screening of uh, Skip Williamson documentary directed by John Kinhart. Uh, thank you, thank you. I think uh, every one of us underground cartoonists owes oh, Skip Williamson a debt of gratitude for what he's done and how he started. Uh, he opened doors for the rest of us to do what we do and uh, continue to uh, open people's minds to uh, the different genres of the cartoon media that's out there. Uh, make sure that you stick around after there will be a Q&A with John Kinhart and Harriet Highland. Uh, there will be a trailer before the film uh, for John's new documentary. And with that, uh, I think we should roll it. There we go. Enjoy pig-headed. John, thank you for that. That was excellent. It was really good. I'm sad at the end. Yeah. 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 Still sad, exactly. Oh, really? Doctor said I'd be fine. Huh? Were you talking to him? Remember when the doctor told you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Doctors can be wrong. That's for sure. Yeah. He's really wrong. Oh, that's sad. You never expected, no. He's 
larger than life, and you've been in such poor health for so long, I figured he'd live forever. Sure. That's how I feel. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Sure. I've got a bunch, but I'll just do one. Go ahead. Uh, can you say what you know, his last days were like, and you know, what passed away from? Oh, he was a severe, I mean, he hit it. You know, he, had a, he was a severe, and the operative word here is severe diabetic starting at age 50. But, you know, he just didn't, you know, he wasn't a person that wanted to live under the restraints that uh, diabetes requires if you want to control the disease. But it's a miracle with, I mean, his blood sugar, normal blood sugar is 120, and when he was diagnosed at 50, his blood sugar was 400. So it's, you know, I mean, now, I mean, it's just remarkable that he lived as long as he did, but that, you know, I mean, it's a very serious disease, and he had a big time. So, you know, he had a lot of strength and stamina, but diabetes will rob you of your health, especially if you don't want to adhere to a stringent lifestyle. But it was renal failure. He'd had quadruple bypass in 19, um, no, 20, oh, 11 years before he died. And it's the diabetes that caused the heart problem because the blood is sticky. And, but it was renal failure, it wasn't a heart attack, it was, it, you know, it destroys your kidneys. Oh. What did he like to eat? What was his favorite food? Well, everything. And he was Ribs very, and all that type of stuff? Oh, he cooked everything, and I think that one of the reasons he lived as long as he did, being a severe diabetic, is that he did eat very well. He didn't, you know, particularly like sweets. Of course, he liked to drink, but, you know, he ate good food, you know, fresh vegetables, and, you know, it was always balanced, so he, he was, you know, ate well, and I think that contributed to the longevity, despite his chronic illness. Did he exercise? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I think it's got to walk around the block, you know. And how much do you want to nag a person? You know? Right. I, I don't like. That. My wife is up there going on. <laughs> you know, it's pointless to try and. But no, he did not like exercise. Hmm. Wow. I don't blame him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it seems like the more you need it, the less you want to do it. I mean, when I was younger, it's like oh. Exercise and eat well. Now that I'm older, I'm like, I don't want to eat well or exercise. There's something that does set in when you get older. I used to run upstairs. Now they're my yeah. nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, two flights. No! The diabetes was definitely the cause of death. Complications of particularly renal More questions? And I'm very happy that it, he didn't linger. Yes, sir. I'd like to thank John for making this film because, like, you know, without this film, like, you know, Skip, his entire life would have, like, probably remained under the radar. And, you know, this film is an opportunity for somebody who didn't get a lot of press to, to kind of tell the story. And it was almost timely that, like, you know, the film was finished at the time that, you know, he passed, you know. So it was an opportunity to document his whole I agree. Him and Jay. Yeah. You know, amazing that you got Jay in there too. I mean, these guys were friends for so long, and I mean, to me, these these, these guys are heroes of mine. You know, Skip Williamson and Jay Lynch are always going to be, you know, part of me and my comics and everything. You know, part of my life, and so that was like the added extra surprise. You know. Skip has an odd kind of fame. It's very desultory, but people that like his work really, really like it. And you find them, like the people, my, I have a good college friend that I'm staying with for the weekend, and her husband was just like, oh, I remember, I'm so, you know, he was so complimentary and kind and remembering all of it. And so, you know, you just, and he's an engineer, you know, he's not in the art world or anything, but people, they're, they're, they're all out there, and they're spread over a very broad spectrum, and he had an obituary that ran in France and Italy, and wow. sort of the, um, the New York Times did a half-page obituary, so 
people, it's not a, a popular kind of fame. It's like, an, like you're talking about, an under yeah. the radar film, fame. But I too, I love the film. I, every time I see it, it took me a long time to watch it, like the second time, but every time I see it, I really am very impressed with it. I think it tells a story that a lot of people have forgotten. The, you know, the 68 riots and all of that. It is really, I love it. I really do love it. I think yeah. you did such a great job. It's emotionally powerful. I mean, and, and, and funny, you know, and sad and poignant, you know, and, and I mean, I knew that he died, Jay, but it's still sad at the end. You see the picture of them together and it's like, oh man, you know, great job. I Just think. a great job. Any other questions? Yeah, actually, a question for the filmmaker. John, why, why did you make this film? What was it about, I mean, were you a fan of the underground cartoon? I mean, it's a, fa it's a fabulous piece of work. I was just curious what it was that inspired you to do it. Well, um, I like documentaries a lot, and I like documentaries about obscure people and, and stories, events, and so I just wanted to make a documentary, you know, that, um, that I might enjoy, and I met Skip through my previous documentary that I made, um, and, um, you know, when I met him, Skip was like, he said just a couple things that kind of suggested that, you know, if I wanted to film more, I could. And so I was looking for a project, and so I, you know, started searching him on the internet and, you know, finding out he had these connections to Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and, you know, the rest of the Chicago 8. And, and then, I guess through his blog or something, I read the story about, um, you know, how they were working on Bijou 1, you know, during the DNC and the, how the protests were, you know, going on around them. And I, you know, I was just like, whoa, you know, how many people know this story where, you know, this early comic from this important comic movement, you know, was, was born during this important moment in history, you know, like that, you know, that's a, you know, that was such an amazing connection. And so, you know, that was the first like profound moment. And then I thought, well, maybe I can build stuff around that. So, um, so we took a trip down to Atlanta and, um, you know, thought, you know, at first I thought, you know, I'll just start filming him, you know, who knows, you know, he, he might lose interest in being filmed later um, or whatever, but, you know, I'll just go film him for a weekend and, you know, at the very least, maybe I'll make a, you know, YouTube video or something. And, um, you know, and Skip had cooked up this idea that we were going to film him getting his first tattoo at age 67, so we did that and that was a lot of fun. And then, you know, Harriet showed up when we went back to the house and, you know, just started filming them and their playful banter and, you know, they start talking about their unconventional divorce and I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm a child of divorce and my parents don't get along, so to see this was just like, <laughs> you know, what is this? And um, So, you know, that's when I started to, I think, develop an emotional bond, you know, that, and, and I wanted to sort of like, you know, maybe peel, try to peel back the layers for that. And um, so, so I just kept, you know, following it and, you know, trying to learn more about the movement, you know, the, the underground comics movement and everything else Skip did and get familiar with his work. Um, but, you know, because I, you know, I didn't grow up in the 60s, I was born in 1979, so, you know, I was coming at this a lot differently than somebody who would have, you know, going, be going to head shops in like, you know, 1971 and pick up Bijou, you know, like, you know, I was learning about it all after the fact. And, you know, and, and Skip, you know, he was a larger than life character and, you know, his work was, was distinct among his peers because, um, you know, he had his political wit and, um, you know, his uh, unique style. So, you know, I just, uh, you know, I wanted to make, like I said, just something that I thought I would enjoy and, and hopefully other people can enjoy too. In terms of making the film, uh, it's been my experience that filmmakers go into a project and they may have certain expectations so there's an idea as far as what the thing is going to be. How did making this particular movie either meet or fail to meet your expectations, change your ideas? Uh, what, was, what was the well, process like? One of my favorite things about making documentaries is the best thing you get is a thing you never plan on. You know, it's that spontaneous thing that happens that, you know, life is sometimes a better writer than, than we are. And so, you know, just, I was always, you know, you're, you're kind of collaborating with life as a documentary filmmaker, rather than, you know, you're directing it, you're just, you know, you're trying to capture it, and then you direct later in the edit room. And, 
um, you know, so like, you know, being introduced to Harriet and seeing their relationship was like an example like that. You know, but then, you know, and then, and then kind of following like, where's that gonna go? Are they gonna like, you know, grow old together in Vermont? And then suddenly, you know, there's this new person, you know, Adrian and, you know, plot twist, you know, so, um, you know, and you know, that those kind of surprises yeah. were, you know, interesting and, and fun. Skip as an individual was never like people would imagine imagine him to be. For example, everyone would assume he was a draft dodger. Oh no, he went to the draft board and went every time they called him. But he didn't wear underwear when he went. So <laughs> he would, you know, the, you know, you have when you go to the dra when you went to the draft board back in the day, you had to stand there, you know, with they made you take all your clothes off, and they were just so flummoxed that this guy was, you know, you know, buck naked. And then he would, you know say all these things and so he got a classification that I you know no you would never hear of like XYZ which, which basically was unsuitable for the draft and believe me <laughs> there were very few people that had that designation I mean it is quite a difference when you grow up with the draft I had four brothers and uh, it's a, it was a reality that I think very few young people these days can understand but they basically even at the height of the Vietnam War they wouldn't take him but he, you know, he didn't, he didn't, he showed up. He was unafraid of all that stuff. So um, he was rather an unusual character. And it was his idea to get married and have kids, not mine. Everyone thinks that, you know, I dragged him off to the suburbs. Oh no, you know, it was all his idea. A good one. Wow. Any other questions? Well, I, I have just one. What has the reaction been so far that you've gotten from this film? Um. Good. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes send out, you know, copies to, you know, cartoonists that I like and, you know, and they will, you know, send compliments or post about it and that's been pretty rewarding. Um, and, you know, we've sh we showed it at um, a bunch of film festivals here and there. Um, you know, it's, it's extremely flattering that SBX was willing to uh, screen it. Um, we premiered it at Newburyport Documentary Film Festival in Massachusetts um, in uh, September of 2016, and I, I, I aimed for that festival because it was like two hours from where Skip was living. Uh, and at that point, he was in pretty poor health. He, he was, uh, the festival people, the directors and, and, and workers drove out there, picked up a bunch of his art, drove it back, and they put up a whole show, which ended up being his last, his final show. And, you know, he came out for the screening, and, you know, he was having trouble walking around, and, you know, he'd walk half a block and need to sit down. And I had never seen, you know, Skip in that condition before. And, you know, normally he's walking around, and, you know, we're trying to keep up with him, and, you know, he just seemed just like this massive, powerful, being and but but you know on this trip it was it all that was changed and you know we were trying to figure out where we we're going to eat but everybody every place was crowded and so we were waiting outside trying to figure out what we we're doing and you know he tripped on the curb and and you know I, at that point I was like let's just get you back and you know um, you know we'll figure out like how to get some food or whatever but um, you know so um, I just bring that brought that story up I know it doesn't quite answer your question but like. Um, just because, uh, you know, it was such a, you know, it, uh, it was a difficult situation to be in because, you know, we were trying to premiere the film and, and, and you know, but like Skip was, you know, it was, um, that was September and he passed away in, in March. So, you know, it was like six months right before. Mm. Let's take one more. Yes, we have two grandchildren, and I moved to Asheville, where my daughter and son-in-law live, and so um, life is quite pleasant for me, I have to say. And Skip told me I would like living in Asheville, and I guess he's right. So I quit working two years, about two years ago, and uh, I never really looked at his work in, to you know, in total, and after he died, I'm just like, looking at all of it and you know anew I'm really astonished at the breadth and depth you know he was an illustrator a cartoonist he wrote a lot he was really very prolific 
always working. He didn't like chaos in his personal life. I think that's what made that second marriage so difficult. He said he found it so difficult to work. And, you know, artists need solitude and some sort of lack of chaos because, you know, when you think of when you're a creative person and the moment strikes, you want to work and you don't want to have it interrupted. You know, so, but I miss him every day. So much, so interesting to talk to. His, you know, his father was a professor, so he's very well read. But life goes on. Mm. Wow. Well, oh, one more. Go ahead. Are there any plans for uh, Skip the State? Uh, licensing his artwork? Well, fortunately, and this is something for artists to think about, um, Jay had contacted, or they had contacted Jay, the Billy Ireland Museum, and so he had started to get together his archives to give to the Billy Ireland, so I've donated a lot of stuff to them, and I'm still going through the stuff, and I'm learning the process about exactly what they want, and they keep, they talk things like a body of work, so they have all the bijous and stuff, and they want to put something in the permanent collection. So I'm happy to tell you that his work does have an excellent home. I mean, they are not, they are the largest cartoon collection in the world. They had a $14 million renovation. Their archives are just, they're, they're enormous, and it's beautifully kept. And like she says, they'll be there forever. So that was a big, I mean, when I walked in there, I said, your home skill. I really am grateful that he made the decision, though, because I, it's not my work, and I, you know, I don't want to make decisions for him, and he, I'm, and he was very, he would, you know, he never filled out forms or did anything like that, but he did arrange to have his archives put there, so I'm following up on that and finding, you know, I'm doing it, you know, sort of bit by bit and giving them things as I get it together and, you know, find out what they are most interested in. So that's where uh, a lot of it will go. And like I said, they want something for their permanent collection. And they're going to have an underground show at the end of 2020. So it does have a good home, I'm happy to tell you. And where he designated it at to go. Oh, very good. Well, it's been a real honor to, to talk to you guys and see this in the area. And John, thank you very much. Thanks for everybody. for. Sure. Yes, you can you can uh, stream it or download it off of Vimeo on demand, um, and I have a store envy where you can purchase the DVD, and all the money goes to the S. Clay Wilson Special Needs Trust. And I have a sack of comic books. If anybody wants any of his work, just come right over there and help yourself. I want it <laughs> to go to people that you know want it and love it. So I'd be happy to give you any of it that I've brought for your enjoyment. Awesome. Very generous. Carol Tyler and Justin Green. Oh, okay. There you go. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.